my name is Trexter Dupre. Today we broadcast live from island number three of the Second Life Book Club Archipelago. Thank you, Linden Lab, for putting this online. We are broadcasting not only from Book Club Island number three, but we're also broadcasting from inside a circular black wall. Why? We do this because our guest is Gautam Batia, whose debut novel is called The Wall. And um, I know I, I praise our authors every week. We haven't had a, a, a dud yet, but this book, is, The Wall, is, is an amazing book. It's epic in many, many ways. And at the same time, um, I feel it reads like an, an intense dramatic play that you can see on a stage in a, you know, in a, in a, in a room with just a, ba a black backdrop, frankly, kind of like The Wall, I guess. This book took Gautam 12 years to write, as I learned from uh, our production meeting. What is the book about? We will ask Gautam, but my quick uh, synopsis would be that uh, this book is about a nation state confined by a huge black wall inside this wall. There's a secular government, but there's a big influence from religion. And nobody knows what's outside this wall. And frankly, nobody really concerns themselves with this question, except for a group of young academics and workers, young revolutionaries, and they're, they're yearning to go beyond uh, this wall and and the book explores this this yearning. It explores the makeup of this particular society. Uh, it's it's absolutely captivating, and uh, you know you read this and you go like, what is behind this wall? And yes, it's a you, you know I mean it's 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 sort of the undercurrent where you like is, is Gautam going to reveal what's behind this wall? But then you you get captivated by again the the different reasons why some people just really don't 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 care about going beyond the wall and some people do anyways i'm 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 rambling here because this is an amazing book gautam thank you thank you so much for coming uh thank you thank you so much for calling me it's, it, i've been looking forward to this for a long time i have no idea what i i forgot where why why this book came on my radar but it's it's just it, it's it's completely nuts now your for, let's start with your avatar uh your avatar is somewhat uh Related to this book, what what why did you choose this avatar? Why did you have us design labor labor over this avatar? So the the avatar is uh, basically uh, it's it's a bird that's uh, that's part of of the world of the wall. Uh, it's a, it's a bird called a, called a garuda, uh, and it's the only it's the only living creature other than human beings themselves um, that exists or, or it can be seen because. Because the garuda can fly, you know, over the wall, so it, the human beings inside the wall can see it, can see the garudas flying in and out, um, and and so it, it's the only living creature that they know exists uh, beyond the wall. And of course, and, then there are legends around around it that that are there in the book. The garudas, they sometimes okay, yeah, they see those garudas fly up on the wall, and w one of the main um, protagonists is also his name is Garuda. I just brought up a slide here with the Garudas. In Hinduism, Garuda is a divine eagle-like sunbird and the king of birds. Um, that's what I learned from Wikipedia. And the Garuda is shown either in zoomorphic or anthropomorphic form. Um, you're an anthropomorphic uh, Garuda. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the wall, uh, I had a production meeting with, with Shyla bef before the show. And I said to Shala, you know, what does the wall symbolize? Let's ask Gautam, what does it symbolize? And I said to Shala, you know, for me, it symbolizes a lack of imagination, a lack of imagination of what the possibilities are beyond your status quo, where you are in life and, and you know, whatnot. And Shala says for her, the, the wall symbolizes fear. And then I realized a lack of imagination is a result of fear. If you're afraid, you don't want to imagine something else um, because you're, you're too afraid of the possibilities, even if they could be much better than your status quo. But anyway, what what does the wall symbolize to you? Right. So I think I think um, I think it, I, what I would say is that it, it's it, if what you, what you say about fear, it, I, I just I just flip it to the the other side of the coin um, and, and talk about comfort. Uh, so. 
uh, one thing that that I was I was very careful about when I was world building um, was was not to make the world within the wall you know a squalid kind of dystopia where life is so hard that there is every reason for people to want to go beyond the wall, but to actually construct a world where life is comfortable except that there is stasis, so it's, it's unchanging, but it's still comfortable. Yeah, and the, well, let me yeah. jump in here because the 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 uh, and we'll we'll get more into it. But the society in Sumer, that's the name of the nation state, is comfortable for most people, and they actually have figured out a total sustainable way of living. I mean, folks here in the room, uh, remember we're inside a wall. We're actually inside the wall right now here in Second Life, but the. They, they don't have resources coming in. They don't have imports. They have to figure out how to harvest, uh, you know, stuff that, that w where they can make clothes out of. They actually also have to figure out how to um, um, get rid of, uh, frankly, uh, dead people. And, and they have figured this out. Uh, and Shyla actually researched it. And she, her question was, uh, yeah, it's a closed ecosystem, and, but there is no bees. So that's amazing too. This is an excellent question, and in fact, it took a, so it, the the question of bees was was foremost in my mind, and that is why all the all the flora that is described um, in the book inside the city is, is self pollinating. So uh, so you know, for example, uh, there is in, in in the city the the color blue signifies status, um, and and there there are some some subplots leading on from that. So I had to find a a, a blue pigment producing plant that was self pollinating because no bees right and so mm -hmm. the, i finally found the wood the wood plant uh, as a self pollinating plant that, that could exist so uh, there was a lot of a lot of fascinating world building problems in constructing this semi closed system um, where only air and water you know are, are unlimited and everything else is is limited so you know just finding out that you know bog bog iron is the only form of iron that's renewable but bog iron is weak. But then I found out that if you actually uh, mix mix bone into into bog iron, you get a much stronger form. So it was actually ah. solving all these problems um, and and just ensuring that that uh, the semi closed system worked in a way that uh, that every every uh, resource could could play a part in the existence of other resources. Uh, yeah. This is absolutely absolutely amazing. And now the bone, as you're saying it, now I now I know what they do with the dead people. And they actually have this in, <laughs> in these towers, these weird towers that we see in the back. Okay, before we continue the conversation, the camera, please. Can I ask the camera to go behind Gautam to his left? There is a hand drawn map that is in the book of Sumer, um, the 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 circular nation state. And then maybe we could uh, we could get a um, a full uh, shot here of this, of the illustration, uh, which is in the book, and the illustration also says the the different parts of the city. There are different um, neighborhoods, um, and it's divided in the in the middle by a straight line, the straight uh, river uh, Raza. Uh, on the one side, uh, you see uh, buildings. In the middle, you see the forum with the with the towers, and then on the other side, you see swampland, and you see um, you see uh, agricultural areas and the stone quarry and a forest and these towers. Now, Ruby, our set builder, has done an amazing job. And I know she's had a lot of pressure this week and she put this together and it's just nuts. So if the camera could now zoom out and basically like a drone uh, go up a little bit so we get a bird's eye view, we are actually sitting in sort of uh, the a replica of the forum. I mean, the forum in the book is much more mag magnificent than this little form that we got off marketplace. But well, <laughs> our budget is limited, Gauta. We're an independent movie. In your imagination, your imagination uh, required the 300 plus million dollars to make it. But um, so if the camera can just pull up straight up into the air, we can see that the straight up looking down, looking down at us, you can see that the river also divides uh, sort of the resource part of it and, and on the other side, the, uh, the city part where the people um, live. And then further up, 
I, I'm looking at the camera. The camera is doing a great job, but if the camera can please go look down from a bird's eye view, just tilt it 90 degrees. We have the best camera camera operator in the business, but um, I think she's she's too enamored with the uh, with the form, and we can see from up high that there are also asteroids sort of floating around here. Um, tell us, Gautam, real quick, a little spoiler. There is a weird threat going on, though. I know we're going back and forth. What is the what what is potentially threatening this neat little enclosed nation state? These red things that are coming up on the sky. So, so uh, in in the book, and and this is you know, this is something that that I'll have to save up for 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 later. Uh, there are times when when the sky inexplicably turns red. Um, mm -hmm. Nothing else happens. No one's injured. No one's harmed. Uh, but the color of the sky changes, and sometimes you see like a star flashing across the sky, uh, again unexplained. And and the science that's developed inside the city is is, is not equipped to. Um, to, to, to answer it. what's happening, and so then of course you have you have like two sets of views. Uh, one is one is naturally that the, the religious group views it as you know uh, as 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 proof of their their beliefs that you know whenever somebody tries to bring down the wall or go beyond the wall, you know this is a sign that the people who built the wall, you know, mean you to stay inside. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas the scientists and the and the rationalists just you know they they say that. We just don't have the answers yet, but maybe we will someday, and that's no reason to um, to, to to not go beyond the wall. So it, so it creates this this conflict and, ten and tension between um, uh, between the various forces inside the city. And what's funny is that this is not a theocracy. Uh, we got to stress this. I mean, there is a secular government, but these religious groups they have they have a lot of influence because uh, you know I mean just like in the so-called real world. Um, Religion has there. There are good things attached. I say this as an uh, agnostic, um, but there are there are also bad things. They uh, simplify things and explain things and 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 calm people down. And maybe some sometimes more inquiry would be uh, actually better. And what I find so interesting in your book also that the the scientists that are depicted, they are. You know they're strong-willed, but they're not necessarily the best communicators. I get, I guess they could be more forceful. Like when I'm reading this, I go like, "Come on, dude, just tell them that this is all BS." What you're talking about? I mean, to the, you know, as a, as a response to what the yeah. what the religious leaders sort of put forward, and that's also kind of mirroring the 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 real world in the COVID era. That sometimes the the communicators uh, of science are. Um, I don't know, not the best communicator. I mean, this is a complex thing, and a and a, and a big uh, topic. But yeah, that's that's just one of one of the things that I really loved about the book. Yeah, I mean, and of course, here it's a little more complex because it, it's very clear that a, a city that is you know so perfectly symmetrical and that also is responding to a question I saw, you know, why it's split down the middle. Uh, uh, the reason for that is that the city has been built in like a perfectly symmetrical way, a perfect circle. Uh, split down a middle exact through by the river being a like a a, a sharp straight line uh, and it's very clear that that it's been built uh, it, it didn't just come into existence right if it's built then somebody built it um, and so actually builders. Like the, the, yeah mm -hmm. the, the builders and so in that sense the, the religious group actually has like a much stronger footing to, to make their claims from because everyone can see the result of, of the builders around them uh, and it's hard to explain it you know in, in any other way Mm -hmm. Well, but uh, yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, but in a complex world that we live in, Gautam, we also know that creationism never dies. I mean, people still uh, find ways to say, well, this complexity, I mean, yeah, it was meant to be complex. But yeah, it's, it's a lot simpler if it's that obviously built uh, artificially. Yeah. Which makes it even more interesting that people don't want to have deeper answers other than our um, revolutionaries. If I could ask uh, my um, help here to bring up the the book stand, because I'm going to read a quick excerpt to start with. And don't fear, Gautam will read as well. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to read a quick uh, excerpt from the wall. 
Let's see, where is the book stand? Oh, can can my uh, vast staff please adjust the book stand so I can see it? Now, this is um, from a section that you kind of sprinkle into the book, Voice in the Dark, where we don't know who says that, right? So it's the narrator speaks directly to the reader without revealing himself. And this is from those from one of the Voice in the Dark um, segments. And this talks about Mithila, who is the head of these young revolutionaries, the young Tarafians. Um, who was Taraf? So he is uh, Taraf is is a kind of semi historical, semi mythical figure um, who dreamt of going beyond the wall and and tried to convert people to the cause around 600 years before the events of of the book and he and he uh, if he was the first one to to imagine the existence of of a horizon and 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 what a horizon might mean in a walled city and so his words inspire generations of people who you know who are in the minority and and want to find a way beyond the wall. And also this excerpt that I'm going to read now that is from this mysterious voice in the dark where we don't know who that is. Um, a term is mentioned, Smara. Now, Smara is yearning. And this is, this is fascinating. The yearning for something outside of the wall is something that is being seen as basically a pathology um, or something that, that you have when you're a child. And then when you're an adult, it, it usually just goes away. And this is just, Gautam, this is just so brilliant. Uh, I mean, it's basically a metaphor for, um, yeah, being absorbed, I guess, by, by the system saying, okay, now uh, these dreams are over. I have a job, I have a family. But I'm gonna just read this quick excerpt here from Voice in the Dark. And here the voice is talking about Mithila. It wasn't as if they desired something strange or radically incomprehensible. It wasn't as if nobody could understand them. Smara, the yearning, has existed as long as the wall. Everyone knows it, feels it. But you see, the young Tarafians were the first to say, in the 500 years after Taraf, that we refuse to live with this yearning anymore, that we're not merely going to want and weep and die. And they were the first in so long to actually try to do something about it. They came out of nowhere, unlooked for, unexpected to people who had never seen anything like them or had long forgotten, and now had their own dreams crystallized into words of passion and madness. Any wonder then that they were loved, reviled, hated, mocked, but would not be ignored? They were trying to transform something fundamental, the root and the essence of everything, naturally, they would be opposed, fought, and put down. Take Mithila, that's the leader of these revolutionaries, so utterly, so touchingly, so bizarrely convinced of her position. She simply couldn't understand, or perhaps she didn't want to understand, why someone might not, after all, honestly and truthfully desire that the wall not be breached. Mithila, when she was in one of her how-can-anyone-possibly-think-differently moods, was difficult to reason with. She maintained that people were brainwashed. Now, this says it all, um, Gautam. Nobody, uh, well, nobody, almost nobody is really interested in in the breach. I mean, this is just like um, in the real world. <laughs> yep. Again, again, like you said earlier, I mean, it's easier with this sort of world that is um, that is sustainable, that, that has a lot going for it in its contained form. But in the physical world, the physical world looks pretty bad right now. For uh, why, why do you think people are still sort of what Mithila basically describes as some as you know why why do, she doesn't understand why people don't want change? Well, I think I think a lot of that has to has to do, and I think this is something explored in the book, is that uh, when you when you are when you are when you have internalized something as natural or just as as being part of reality. Um, and not something something contingent uh, that can be altered, then you will accordingly be passive or, or quiescent, as, as the case may be. And the and the whole and the whole uh, attempt that the, the young Tarafians have in the book is to actually first before anything else can happen uh, is to give people language through which they can describe, um, yeah. you know, the possibility of something beyond the wall. And until you have the words and the, and the language for that, you wouldn't be even be able to imagine. Imagine it, and until you can, until and as long as you can't imagine it, you can't act on it. 
um, so I think I think that's what it's about in in large part. This is really great that you bring this up because in our pre-production <laughs> meeting, um, Shaila also talked about uh, the language part and uh, this term for for yearning. Um, Smara is actually later in the book. Um, I don't want to spoil it, but it has actually a different meaning. Um, and and so that, that that's one of the one of the big terms in the story. Um, I'm bringing up a a slide here from a guy by the name of Guy Deutscher, uh, which you mentioned in an interview, um, wrote a book called Through the Language Glass. And he says, a nation's language, so we are often told, reflects its culture, psyche, and modes of thought. So the, so the language is um, a consensus, I guess, but, but it's also con confinement in our own minds, just like a wall. Yeah, and Guy, Guy Dosher is like a, a huge influence on, on this book. Um, he, 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 in fact, he begins the book with with the the, the term the wine dark wine dark sea in Homer's Iliad, and then explains how uh, the Greeks had a different spectrum of color, which is why they saw and wrote about the sea as, as being the color of wine. And mm -hmm. so, effectively, I mean, the the, the way you're, the, the, he really explains how language kind of structures the world in a very nuanced way, it's not not as a simple simple causation. Way not 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 in the discredited separate war hypothesis way, but in a much more nuanced and layered way, a, a feedback loop between between language and and the world. Mm -hmm. But does it affect the people in 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 a um, world that is that is that is pretty homogeneous? I mean, not, nobody comes out and and goes into this world of the wall. I mean, they should have. Um, they should have consensus. As I'm saying this, I know why they don't have consensus because they got <laughs> religious people, they got secular people, and they got the scientists. And and you know they fight among uh, you know who who has the agency over the interpretation of what's happening. Yeah, yeah, and 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 the, and the whole I mean part of the conflict is that that for example you know someone like Taraf has been able to imagine what a horizon might look like, um, and and he's put it down in words. Uh, but not everyone else can. So, you know, just trying to get people to see um, is is uh, is itself a challenge. Ah, Ava here in the chat says, I'm I'm looking at the chat. Caballo says, so the book is more about why the city was split down the middle. Then I don't think so. I, th but but this uh, this leads me to a good question about class uh, class differences because one of the things that they have not solved in this sort of sustainable economic economically sustainable cycle here in the city is actually class differences and i was going to ask gautam how he sees the the different uh stratospheres socioeconomic stratospheres in 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 the wall city in, in sumer the city of the wall if there is actually upward mobility um but before we go there ava is saying do they not need a fresh gene pool now one really cool thing about the book is that um Heterosexual relationships are not really encouraged because they produce too many babies. So one of the things that is really important is actually the population cap. And I brought up a slide here with a with a quote from the book. Um, this is from a uh, revolutionary who was um, mounting a revolution, uh, and he wrote a uh, several. He wrote a lot, but this is uh, from one of his manifestos where he writes, let us begin with population. It is clear that in limited space, bounded by a wall, population must be maintained at near constant levels. The intersection of population control and the class structure gives you the marriage license. Remember that the child cap and the marriage license operate together. There are penalties for having children outside of a licensed marriage and the cost of the marriage license is proportional to the difference in circles between the two individuals who wish to get married. I forgot to say that there's all these different circles that um, symbolize the different classes. So workers, um, outcasts, the unforgiven, and, uh, and the upper echelon of administration officials and such. But talk a little bit about Gautam, about this, um, the fresh gene pool and the population cap here. Yeah, so I, I, I remember having having done uh, initial research on on the on the issue of like what's the minimal number of people um, that need that that needs that needs to exist for like gene pool issues issues not to 
uh, not not to arise and and accordingly like kind of decided upon the dimensions and the uh, the size of, of the city uh, there's also like i mean I, I guess like there is uh, it might seem a bit bit of like a deuce ex machina as far as book 1 goes um, but but i i it, it will be kind of explained in in book 2 uh, that that uh, that most uh, most diseases have been eradicated. Like it's a, it's a far fu- it's a far future world, um, mm-hmm. and and this uh, and the population does not actually um, suffer from you know the usual uh, genetic and non genetic diseases because you know it, they've kind of been uh, been eradicated over many many generations. And the reason for that will, will become clear in, in book two. But so in, so in book one it's like an assumption. So you know uh, so just take it at that. Uh, but of course, I mean, so the, as as far as the the issue of the uh, the population cap goes, um, it, it's kind of a standard. Um, in in uh, so one of the things, of course, is that as in all science fiction, one of the questions that you explore um, is uh, what if you change the one thing or two things about a world? What are, what other things would be different? Um, mm-hmm. And what does that sh- tell you about the contingencies of of our world? Uh, and of course, like in, in our world. Uh, the the rhetoric of population explosion, population expansion, uh, is often used to to divert attention from the fact that it's not that resources are scarce, but just distributed, you know, in in ways that that are, are oppressive. Yes. Uh, but if 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 you had a literal physical boundary, and and literal literally um, uh, finite resources, then population would become relevant. Um, and what what else would flow from that? So as 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 you pointed out. Um, in 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 in, our, in the history of our world, uh, when, when heterosexuality was has often been taken in many societies, although not all, as the norm, uh, and homosexuality as one of the deviations from the norm, that would be reversed uh, because the the kind of political economy would would have a different imperative, uh, and and of course you'd then have to have an enforceable population cap that you you know enforce through a system of disincentives and incentives and, and so on. Uh, so that that's that's a number of issues in and around uh, you know. How the, the the physical limitations in the world and its and its kind of and the political economy that is constructed around those physical limitations would affect society and issues like relationships, population, and so on. This is really great that you're saying is, and thank you for mentioning the the myth of the um, overpopulation. And this is this is a large topic as well. But I just wanted to repeat that uh, for folks here um, that uh, the when we're talking about overpopulation, we really need to uh, look at the facts that a fairly large upper echelon of society is is using most resources. So that that is a bigger problem than uh, than um, poor people, um, excuse my language, uh, churning out too many kids. Um, now, we 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 got into this by talking also about class. So there is there is class. This is a this is a classist society. Is it is there uh, upward mobility? Is this a um, a true meritocracy? Which people people who watch this every week know that that uh, I, I'm a firm believer that this is a total myth. The meritocracy as it stands today. But what but what about it? I mean, there are people from different parts and the the revolutionaries some of them are workers some of them study at the academy so you know they 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 uh, they mingle there um yeah so it, it's you know it, it this is so it, uh, piketty piketty in his in his in his second book you know he, he begins by saying that every society needs a set of narratives or myths to justify inequality uh you know and and so uh, so again the the semi closed system with scarce resources um I think allowed me to to visualize that in somewhat stark terms, because again, when you have a a, a very limited set of resources, um, which need to be used in certain ways uh, in order for society to survive, then the justification for a, a very specialized kind of division of of labor to ensure that all that needs to be done is done by someone uh, becomes, in a certain sense, you know, easier to sustain and to and to build up society based on that kind of division. Um, so in, in in Sumer, then that division of labor exists through the different circles um, mm-hmm. that are that are you know are defined by the various circular tributaries of of the river. So you already have a natural formation that divides up the city into 15 circles. 
um, and then, uh, then well, that sorry to interrupt, but that and obviously also has to be tightly managed because if if there's too much upward uh, mobility, if that's the if that's the story that is being sold, because the uh, population uh, influx is finite or non-existent. I mean, there is no no immigrants coming in who can do the dirty work, so some people have to do it. Yes, exactly. Uh, but but again, it, it's not that you you consign all the the dirty work to to one you know uh, class or, or one circle, uh, which again you know that that would be the easy way out. You know you'd have like a permanently highly oppressed underclass. You know and and as as many dystopic novels do, right? But that would just be again like almost a cop out because that's that's almost too easy. So so in that sense, again, it's it's there is a class system in the sense. That you know, uh, there is a ruling class that lives closer to the center of the circle, um, mm. but at the same time, for example, um, ev every every uh, every law or, or decision that kind of alters the law of the city uh, has to be put to a, to a referendum um, uh, to each circle, each circle wise. So in that sense, it's, it's not that the people in the latter circles you know are completely locked out of, of political power. In fact, in fact, in fact. In, a major point of conflict in the book involves um, issues around land reform and and the power of the latter circles to to you know use the vote to to force through certain kinds of reforms. Uh, so I felt that I should actually have that you know, interaction between classes and the class structure uh, more complex than a straightforward you know oppressive right. system that we are so often used. And, and and they also have sort of these these like public meetings where where people can at least sort of voice their opinion. You know, sort of upfront, everybody is sort of in the front row with the with the elders and can at least shout at them, and they res they respond to them. Yes, so, <laughs> to, so you to, have to, to every you, heckler. Yeah, so, so you have to you have to maintain your you have to maintain your hegemony more through persuasion than through than through naked force, uh, which I think is raises a number of more complex questions than just you know maintaining it through force. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to read this here. Caballo says, and we're talking about that language is itself a wall or barrier that all beings have a difficult time to get over. Yeah. Um, I want to briefly before uh, before Gautam is going to read us um, a little thing here. What I found really uh, hilarious, uh, another quote here, um, very funny, but also very fitting. There, there is there is some really funny aspects in this book as well. There's a group, the young hedonists. Um, these are uh, privileged kids. And, um, you know, because they come from privilege, they have nothing better to do than, than I guess, uh, run around and do pranks and stuff like that. And so here's a little quote from when the uh, when the young hedonists, I think, first appear. And, you know, they, they just do sort of completely mindless, harmless pranks. And the revolutionaries, they kind of want to at various points recruit them, you know, like, you know, what? why are you wasting your energy uh, with pranks, you know, let's mount a revolution. This quote here, suddenly a group of shadowy figures burst out from a passageway. Mithila, the, the leader of the revolutionaries, saw seven or eight people riding upon oblong two-wheeled contraptions. One foot rested upon the body of the vehicle while the other pushed the ground to generate momentum. From the end of the machine's base rose a long straight rod which branched out into handlebars for direction and steering. Now, this is not so much um, depicting the hedonists in their sort of mindless, uh, uh, I don't know, time-wasting uh, pursuits, but it shows, it describes something, a machine, Gautam. There's a few machines in this book, and one of them, Ava figured it out, a scooter. Absolutely. Yeah, a, little, a, ch a challenge, a challenge to like describe it without the name for it. Right? So, <laughs> so a lot of a lot of the book was actually. Like, yeah, that was so well, but it's so well described. It was so well described, but but uh, how, how did you? I mean, because the tech in there is is limited, and and you're not going into a lot of detail. I think it's it's brilliant how you how you put it in, but you don't go into like you know a hard sci-fi, which I'm not a big hard sci-fi fan frankly and i think if you put like 50 pages to describe processes i would get pretty bored <laughs> but you throw in the scooter here which is so cool yeah of course of course it's not a motorized scooter like it's it's, 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 it's a more manual <laughs> manually which is actually you know it's, it's really interesting you brought up this scene because um the, this group is called the, the golden youth um in, in the book and it actually ah, that's right. only after reading uh, only much after writing the book I, I actually found out um, that the the golden youth was the, the term given to 
the sons and daughters of the soviet uh the soviet um uh, upper upper crust in the stalinist era uh, oh they were God. called the golden youth and and this, this i found out in the, in the in the series of books by montefiore you know sashenka uh, that that the trip the, trilogy, the, trilogy, the moscow trilogy so it, that it, is but, funny yeah it wasn't intended but but it turned out to be quite you know similar in that you have like the the sons and daughters of the ruling class kind of totally dissociated with you know uh what's happening around them and they're called the golden youth so so yeah now i refer to this as this group as the young hedonists but the golden youth are actually the the privileged people so does that mean that the hedonists also recruit from from lower classes and they can sort of hang out and do stuff with them well so as as you as as you'll see in the book uh sometimes they do but it it's it's kind of like you know the the power equation is always asymmetrical so uh, so obviously i mean mm-hmm. they, they may get somebody to kind of show that you know uh, they are intrusive and all that but of course it's it's the it's the people the, the, the son you know, daughters of the, of the ruling class who kind of are are in a sense um, you know uh, running the show uh, right. with with a few you know there's a little sub subversive angle there but that 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 happens in the book and and i, I won't spoil it <laughs> don't don't spoil and uh, uh, there, there's one other tech that is being hinted at and i'm sure maybe that's also picked up in the horizon which is kind of cryogenic chambers right because uh, she goes mithila goes um uh, in the basement and then she finds these cryogenic chambers of of people who were uh rulers at some point and they they are they're lying in there and they want to sort of write it all out until uh i don't i i'm not sure until when so i i i threw up this this quote uh this um slide up here with the quote and uh the guy says as long as the machine runs this chamber is ours nobody nobody can break through even with their most powerful weapons i'm yours until the machine stops so so real quick what's what's that all about without you, you don't have to spoil anything but uh yeah so i mean you 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 i think you're right as, as everyone can see that that uh, those are cryogenic preservation chambers a tech that's obviously not known to to the city and so it's it's come uh-huh, from it must and, come from um, somewhere else then. yeah yeah and oh. where it comes from is, is something that that you will find out in in book 2 i i i can assure you you will find out like the, oh the, the god um, so i will say <laughs> i will say that so the... <laughs> i'm sorry i mean i'm jumping in here because i cannot read i have a different i have an author coming i got to cancel next week's authors this is ridiculous <laughs> well, book 2 is coming out in a month's time i i, I will say that the, the the term the machine stops is a, is a bit of a hat tip reference to um to E.M. Foster's uh, The Machine Stops uh, short story, one of those classic science fiction short mm-hmm. stories, uh, written way back in 1909. Uh, one, one of my favorites. Uh, oh, so, yeah. so I, just to, I put a little reference to E.M. Foster's machine, The Machine Stops there. Just a little like, you know, uh, nudge, nudge, wink, wink kind of reference. Okay, I got to tell this here, the folks in world, if they please find a link to The Machine Stops by Ian Foster. Now we got we to gotta read. Um, uh, Gautam, if I could ask you to stand up and uh, a book display will magically um, reappear out of, uh, out of nowhere, I hope. Uh, you never know with Second Life. Here it is. Here's the book display. And Gautam is, is going forward here. You stand. No, no, no. This is good. This is good. Okay, okay, we okay. can adjust the display. Uh, to perfectly uh suit your your position here um and what are we hearing i i believe we're hearing an excerpt where um the folks in the in the revolutionary group uh try to imagine something that they have never seen which is yeah so i'll so i'll start with i'll start with that um with that passage um and you know depending on on how much time it takes to read it out you can do more or, or stop there So, so this is yeah this 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 is this is this is um a passage from early on in the world chapter chapter 2 and um and the context is that that Vitila who is the protagonist um is is in a me- in a meeting with with the group of of revolutionaries um and uh, and she's promised them that they're going to try a, an experiment uh, so they've just asked her that so are we doing the experiment today and so I'll start from from her her response to that and then start reading so so I'll start now uh, Uh, I am Mithila replied but it's going to be hard so prepare yourselves we are all ready well then let's start first a prelude i'm going to speak out some of the lines from chapter 11 of sarah's beyond what before his ostracism she paused her face turned up her eyes half closed 
in sumer says taraf the wall is the end of all things whether you stand in the maidan or walk to the forum or wander into the open fields or even if you ascend the council hall to the tallest tower no matter how far you go or how high you climb at the end of all things you see the wall but imagine if you can your eyes upon an unbroken world there's a word for such a thing it is called horizon our dictionaries don't have it our songs don't sing of it our art doesn't paint it but perhaps there is a way to imagine it imagine yourself standing on the edge of lake sumer on a clear spring morning in front of you the wall to the north the farmlands to the south the last scattered houses of the of the 15th mandala but now imagine all that gone no farms no buildings and no wall only water only water extending from your feet everywhere all you can see is sky and water until they merge mithila stopped close your eyes she waited a minute passed can you see it shali was the first to shake his head it's too difficult mithila by his side chandra's eyes flickered open i feel there's a block most times a word gives me an image but phrases like all you can see everywhere i sense what they mean but there's no image i can't you know imagine it you're being too quick said vithila there's a way to do it that's why taraf calls it a way of seeing wait close your eyes again ready there was a murmur now think of lake sumer as taraf says imagine the water how it swells and ebbs the quiet sound of the waves lapping on the shore the dusty light glinting on the ripples it's the water it lets you see the ground beneath blurry shifting in you go darker deeper the cold consumes you and as you go further instead of having the wall and the field simply vanish in an instant gradually make them recede and let the water flow in to fill the empty space slowly watch them become smaller watch them go further until shali gasped and his eyes flew open mithila i had it for a moment i had it but then mithila leaned forward what was it like shali's face had taken on a searching far away look a look none of them had seen before horrible there was no end i felt as if something was filling up inside me like my heart was about to burst and i felt afraid i had to had to open my eyes these said mithila taraf's visions taraf the only one who was able to recall the dreams of our childhood and give them words words for us for all the good that they do chandra cut in he took on his eyes what do you mean he has a point you know mankala said what are you going to do with this start reading groups like ours in every corner of the city conduct this experiment with every citizen see the rough visions and want them we have his words which aren't going anywhere mankala interrupted mithila we have been trying this for two years last festival we performed that play alwar wrote stuffed with the rough lines it flopped could have been because they are all rubbish actors but i doubt that was the only reason alwar twitched but didn't speak you've tried singing the rough poems in the academy in the maidan during the harvest celebration everywhere and some people listen yes but nowhere near enough what we need and i can promise you it's not because of your voice let's face it our propaganda is right down there in the crap holes mithila stood and began to pace do you remember one of the last things garuda ever said he said he said he dreamed of a new language a language that would be free that mankala said has never felt further away i don't know mithila replied when i read taraf i feel that there are these words words that carry a memory words that exist outside of the city words that have their own place words in which things could happen a world could happen when he says but imagine if you can your eyes upon an unbroken world there's a word for such a thing it is called horizon she paused horizon she said the word slowly letting her tongue linger 
over each syllable. Think of this word. Think of all that it could do. And think of a language like that and what we could do with it. That, said Alvar, is a thousand-year project. Mathila laughed. Then we need to start right now, don't we? Yeah, so that's, that's this passage where they're, they're trying to, you know, see or understand the horizon and, and build a language around that. Wonderful. This is Gautam Bhatia reading from uh, the wall. And again, this is, um, you, you can take, take a seat and we'll, we'll uh, talk a little bit more before the next um, excerpts, which are going to come from the horizon. Uh, yeah, this is Mithila, the leader of these revolutionaries, the young Tarafians, and you mentioned uh, Tarap, who was uh, ostracized. And this is also another interesting aspect of the book and then this closed society. So he was, when he was, uh, when he tried to mount the revolution, I always forget, what, maybe 500 years ago or something like that. Um, and he, and this was unsuccessful, the, the, the punishment that he got was, um, you know, he was he was not executed or anything, but he was ostracized. He was, uh, nobody was allowed to, I guess, talk to him. And he was just wandering the streets until he committed suicide. Or tell us a little bit about this aspect of it. Like, what was the, how did the, the punishment look for this, um, for this revolutionary? Tara. Yeah, so I mean, so ostracism is, is obviously, I mean, it's, it's literally taken from from Greek, from from classical Greek history. That was the punishment that they had. Um, so I, I, I pretty transparently borrowed it from there. Uh, and the way that ostracism works is that so there's, there's no there's no death penalty and and anything of that kind. Uh, and ostracism isn't even isn't even um, a secular punishment. It's a relig it's a religious punishment that's enforced by the by the shootans, the the religious group. And therefore, um, it, it, it's only enforced at those points in the city's history, when the balance of power is such that the the Shurtans actually hold a lot of a lot of power, which hmm. they don't right now, but back then they, they did. So uh, it basically morphs in and out of it, it. Sort of the pendulum swings from theocracy to to non-theocracy in a way. Then. Well, yeah, it hasn't been a theocracy for a long time, but even in what is not formally a theocracy, often religious groups hold a lot of you know, informal power when, when you know, the, the secular authorities will just you know, not often intervene, you know, at, at, just to ensure that the balance between them is kept. Uh, so it needn't to be a formal theocracy uh, for, mm -hmm. you know, groups to still have power. But in, in this case, uh, it's it's a punishment that's long gone out of out of use because the power of the Shurtans has decreased over the years. But it used to exist and, the, and there's often a threat that it, it may come back at, at some point. And ostracism basically means, as it as it did, uh, you know, in the Greek sense, it's exile. But obviously, you you can't be exiled in a city that's completely surrounded by a wall. So it just simply means that nobody else in the city is allowed to to talk to you or to have any kinds of of dealings or engagement with you. Um, and and that is effectively a sentence of death in in a city where, by definition, mutualism is the only way in which you can survive, because resources are scarce. Everyone depends on everybody else, and and so on. Uh, you so can't was, even it, ask someone for for food, or they're not allowed to give you. Well, food you, you can, but but if but if they give it to you, then they fall foul of the of the anger of the shurtans, and so you know. So it, it's effectively a, an, an exile within the city, uh, mm -hmm. which, for all practical purposes, eventually turns into a sentence of death, um, and that's been kind of like a dark period in the city's history, and you know, the threat of its revival is always kind of on the edge or in the shadows. This is really this is really interesting because that also makes these young new revolutionaries of the present time they don't know what what they face if they if they fail or if they get caught and and right because that's that that's a little bit un, unclear I mean it, they they could it could very well be that harsh I, I, since you mentioned the shortans these are the the, the religious um, leaders this the sect or whatever you call it or state religion. Uh, what I find fascinating, Shaila, my co-producer, found out that you're a big fan of. Uh, I don't read any authors' interview, Gautam. I just read the work, <laughs> and and that that's the be that's the synergy between me and uh, and Shaila because she looks uh, at your history and the interviews you've given, and then um, we meet, and I read the work, and I I go like you know who is this person who creates this work. And in the in the work, the the shurtans um, are 
very much against um, writing stuff down. They have an oral tradition. Um, and uh, matter of fact, one of the elders writes a big encyclopedia and that kind of gets destroyed. But the Shurtans are very much against writing stuff down. And that is being challenged in, in, in a few parts of the book and in dialogue with uh, with other leaders and with, with, with the scientists. And, you know, uh, so it, it, it looks to me that there are there are a lot of flaws with the oral tradition as it presents itself because there's no accountability what actually happened. And the Shurtans, of course, say, well, yeah, we, we like oral tradition. And then the, the secular leaders go or, or other people go like, you know, yeah, but you have this book where everything is written down. And they go like, well, that book, that's the truth. I mean, that's the that's sort of the circular logic or illogic from, from my point of view that that religious groups often use. But you're a fan of oral tradition, so square that circle. <laughs> Good or bad, <laughs> or abused by uh, nefarious interests, I guess. Well, so I think I think uh, one of the things I really wanted to do in this book was to ensure that everyone had a good argument, uh, including... Now you're a lawyer. This is the <laughs> legal... <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, so, it was, yeah, so, so even, even the people uh, who appear to be antagonists, uh, you know, uh, I'm not saying that they are or are not, uh, because the story isn't over yet. But even the people who appear to be antagonists should have should have good arguments. Um, and so the, the Shurtan argument for oral, oral tradition is that the moment that you, you write things down, uh, you know, you you end up ensuring that there is like one version that is an original and, and everything else then you know, follows from that. And that's the argument that they make. Now, of course, in the book, it's kind of like a bad faith argument. Um, and and that's, that's pretty clear. But the argument itself actually taps into, into a pretty you know, old debate. Um, and it is it is true, and as and has been. Uh, uh, wait, I think I think did you just vanish? Um, I'm still I'm still. I'll, I'll come okay. back. I'll come back. Keep talking. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So there is there is there is a long-standing debate. Um, the shortens have the shortens have just uh, took me and ostracized <laughs> me very briefly. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So so uh, so there is there is that. Uh, and if you, if you read a, a book called The Singer of Tales. Um, you know, it's about uh, the, the the recovery of the oral epic tradition uh, um, in Central Europe, and and there is a discussion about how the advent of writing effectively destroyed the oral tradition because the, the entire idea of an original text uh, comes from comes from from writing, and in the oral tradition there was no original; it was recreated each time, and that's explored very interestingly by by the Albanian writer Ismail Kadare. In a book called *The File on Edge*, which is a fictional version of of *The Singer of Tales*, uh, taking place in Albania. So all these things were in my mind, and ultimately, I, I didn't want to give like a clear answer. Uh, but th there is a debate between, you know, oral and written traditions, and you know, the, the reader can decide what which argument they find more convincing. And this is really, again, I cannot stress this enough. If you're just tuning in, uh, this is the Second Life Book Club with Gautam Bhatia with his book, The Wall. Uh, if you're just tuning in, you're you tuned in an hour too late. I'm sorry. Just tune out. No, stay, <laughs> stay, stay here and and get this book. And you just mentioned that um, Shaila prepared this slide. Also, The Singer of Tales is a book by Al Albert um, Lord, and um, Shaila pulled this quote. Stated briefly, oral epic song is narrative poetry composed in a manner evolved over many generations by singers of tales who did not know how to write. It consists of the building of metrical lines and half lines by means of formulas and formulaic expressions and of the building of songs by the use of themes. Uh, here from the book, The Singer of Tales. And as a matter of fact, and, and I mean, this is really what makes this, what makes your book, I think, exceptional is that all these different factions have very strong arguments and they argue with a certain amount of respect, I would say, broadly speaking, and uh, the, the pros and cons of, of oral tradition, how it can be used to um, to connect people to the past and to their own culture. And on the other hand, um, uh, use it to abuse um, powers, the power structure, or perpetuate the power structure, is 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 very visible. I mean, the young the young Tarafians. I mean, she uh, Mithila studies to to be a singer, I guess, right? I mean, and yep. and, and 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 they unearth uh, 
knowledge through song uh, and they use it to um, to motivate themselves in, in their cause while the short tons are using uh, their oral traditions to manipulate. But anyways, let, let's, oh my God, we have five minutes and then we're, but we, we can go over time. We, we have agency over this. <laughs> we don't have any elders to um, <laughs> respond to. Are you sure you want to read from the horizon? Are you going to spoil? They're not. They're both. Both. So I, I picked two passages, like you said, and they're both nine spoilers. Um, if we have time for one, I can pick one of oh, them. Oh, absolutely! Uh, Wait. Uh, here is what I tweeted earlier. This is the last page. This is the last page of the uh, of the wall. A voice in the dark for oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. I must confess, I did not foresee this. This changes everything. So I'm not going to say I'm not going to say <laughs> if they're successful to breach the wall. OK, I don't know if they poke a hole in it or if they I don't know. Uh, a spaceship <laughs> comes down and teleports them up or whatnot. You've got you got to read it yourself. Uh, it's unbe it's unbelievable. But uh, but yeah, Gautam uh, shamelessly put this uh, cliffhanger here. So let's read from the horizon. The, uh, let's read the prologue. Yeah, we, we can read both. Let's read the prologue first here. Okay. Uh, am I am I close to the to the? Oh, okay, I am. I am. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Uh, let me let me just open up that file one second. And and it it it, it um. Yeah, whatever you need to to set up. Basically, again, I'm I'm not spoiling. I mean, I'm not spoiling anything. Uh, <laughs> Mithila and her friends are trying to breach the wall. Um, and they're steadfast and they're continuing it against all odds. And uh, that's what the wall is about. And here comes the horizon. Yeah, so, so this is, this is yeah, so I, I picked two passages. Uh, so this is from the prologue and it's, it's quite different um, from, the, from the previous uh, passage. This is kind of more all action um, stuff. Um, and, and this is so the, the, the prologue, so a lot in, in, in the wall, there are a lot of references to um, a, a failed revolution that had taken place around 27 years before the before the events of the wall. Oh yeah, that's um, right. Yeah, and it, it was called the it was called the uh, you know the, the mutiny of Savarian after the person who led the person who led the, the revolution, uh, and it, it had ultimately been put down. Uh, but its its echoes, you know, as, as revolutions tend to do, it, it, its echoes are still very much in the present. Um, so the, the the prologue begins with with a flashback to the time of the revolution. Um, and uh, it, it and one of the characters who who appears in the wall, a character called Maji from the Fifteenth Circle. So she is is a much younger woman at the time of the revolution. She's part of it, um, and so the, the prologue is from her perspective. Um, and what's happened here is that there has been a failed attempt by uh, by the revolutionaries to capture the president uh, of of the elders, and and they have basically been ambushed. Uh, and Maji and along with her another another revolutionary called Rahul have 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 fled uh, after the ambush and they've come into the into the first circle where a sympathetic uh, elder counselor has given them shelter you know in in her house uh, and so this is a conversation between them as the soldiers you know, look for them outside uh, so they're talking to each other so I'm going to start reading uh, from um, from 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 there and this is in, in present tense the um, Every limb in her body aches, but Maji doesn't dare go and collapse upon the bed. She stumbles to a corner of the room, next to the window, and slumps to the floor, her back against the wall. Her right shoulder, where she'd taken a blade, has begun to sting, sending out little ripples of pain. Maji winces. Rahul walks past her to stand by the window. What was the point of running, she says. Don't you care to live, Rahul asks mildly. We failed, Maji trails off. Why did you join the revolution, Maji 15? The question throws her. She is back in the 15th mandala. It is a summer day. They crowd the terraces flush in the sun. Sweat mingles with anticipation. The wall looms in the distance. She shades her kajal-limbed eyes with her palms. Wouldn't you deck yourself up for the day the world will change with lamp black you can't afford? and looks at the man who stands before them. He is perched precariously on a parapet, dressed in a rebel blue that she knows he can't afford. 
His arms are spread, his body taut, his eyes dancing. Can you see it? He calls. The vision fades. Just for a moment, says Maji. Savarian showed me a city without circles. It was enough for a lifetime. And dying in the Rahi fields will help you? What is left to live for, Captain? She adds as an afterthought. What has my life been for? You won't know unless you live. He stops, putting a finger to his lips. Margie's eyes struggle to adjust to the dark, even though moonlight is streaming in through the window. She can hear herself breathe. Below them, there is a rapping at the front door. A creak. Yes, Malati's voice floats up to them. Counselor Malati, sorry for disturbing you so late or early. Uh, yes, there are rebels on the loose in the mandala. I thought we were winning. We are, but they've come in from the north, the farmlands. Rahul stands rigid at the window. Bit lax of you, Madish, Malati says after a pause. Good luck with your search. Counselor, yes, Iron enters Malati's voice. We are doing a house-to-house search. No, Madish six, Malati says. You are searching empty houses in case they've crept into a garden or a study. I am very much in my house. But they might have climbed up through a window. Do you want to try climbing to test the theory? Beneath the window, there is muttering. Counselor, Madish speaks again. President Hansa specifically told us to... I will answer to the president. Six, Malati snaps. Now stop wasting my time and find those rebels. Isn't there a barricade that needs tearing down? More muttering. Maji can hardly move. Her body is hurting too much. But Rahul is crouched by the window, blade in hand. A few minutes pass in silence. Rahul relaxes. Safe. Maji breathes. Rahul allows himself to slump, sliding down against the wall, dropping his blade. Maji hears it clatter. For a while, neither of them says anything. Duma, Rahul whispers at last. Mm, Captain, is it really true what they say about the unforgiven? Maji laughs in her throat. What, you think I'm mad? No, not, not you, no, you know. I know what. Don't make me say it. She looks at him in the dark. How long have you been waiting to ask? Ever since Savarian assigned you to my company, Rahul says ruefully. Never spoken to someone from the Duma before? He rubs his neck. Not as a companion. Not until the revolution. Only as labor. I'm not surprised. I know, I know. Could be that Savarian has the right idea with his whole integration thing. Maji smiles. Alora, she says. What? Alora, the builder, Captain. The only builder we of the Duma acknowledge. Who stood against the wall and was punished for it. Who asked us to have faith because light will come from light. Alora, she lets her voice deepen. We will carry the memory of your name like hot iron beneath the tongue. He turns to her. There is so much I don't know about my own city, this side of the wall. Things I've begun to see, to touch, ever since I've joined the revolution, because the Sumer Savarian dreamt of felt more real than the one we live in. Will you take me to the Duma once this is over and tell me how you live? That's not an order, he adds hurriedly. She is touched in spite of herself. They both know it is never going to happen. Yes, Captain, you can come. Thank you. To fill the silence, she says, I have a question too. Ask. You of the 11th, I have heard you talk amongst yourselves upon the barricades. You have your own name for Savarian. Garuda, why is that? It is his turn to laugh. We have our stories too. Go on. He thinks for a while. Listen then, he says at last, as if he has been waiting to tell. Season after season in the long afternoons, when the sun shines golden upon the Rahi fields, we have seen the Garudas fly. Rahul's voice changes, growing soft like dew. They come from behind, from beyond the wall, and there they return. From the sky they look upon us while we toil, as if language is a memory that has been taken from them, and they would speak to us if they could remember. But in the fields we remember. His voice quickens. Two brothers they were. They flew together. 
Karura flew too high, too close to the sun. But before she could burn him in her rage, Samati interceded. He took upon himself the bolt meant for Garuda. His wings were charred and he was hurled down to the ground. Garuda escaped, but in punishment, words dried up in his throat forever, turning to ashes like Samati's wings. And to separate the two brothers, the wall of Sumer came to be. This side we dwell, the daughters and sons of Samati, doomed only to gaze upon our sky-faring cousins, who come back to us from beyond the wall, but can neither speak nor stay. I've never heard this story, Maji whispers. A story spun in the forever hours upon the Rahi fields, watching the sky in the shadow of the wall. And we call Savari and Garuda because that's how he came to us, on the wings of a dream, to show us what we might have been and what we might be again. Maji smiles. Don't think me rude, Captain, but I am from the Duma. We are on the side of the lost, so I can't help seeing this from Samati's point of view. What? That if you want to fly, someone must sacrifice themselves for you. Oh, the door swings open. Rahul leaps to his feet, but it is only Malati at the threshold. Ball rise. You need to get out of here. We will, Rahul says. Do you know the lay of the upper circles? They are only guarding the bridges, Malati says. If you go carefully, you will be able to get as far as the seventh without meeting the watch. Then it's up to you. Maji blurts out. But why are you helping us, counsellor? Rahul winces, but Malati does not appear to take offence. You've lost your revolution, she says. I can afford to save two lives. So that's where the scene ends. And uh, just by way of context again, uh, the Duma is kind of the last bit of behind near the wall uh, where the 15 circle is. I was just going to ask, the Duma is 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 really where um, the outcasts live or whatever that means? Not, not, not so much the outcasts, but kind of it's, it's, the, it's the last bit next to the wall and it's kind of a place where the upper circles don't really go because they, they it's kind of, you know, uh, it's, it's where people who, you know, are there who sometimes, well, are, are portrayed as being criminals and, you know, pickpockets and thieves and so on. That's so, what the middle class suburbans usually call the bad part of town. Yeah, yeah, basically. basically. So that's the Duma. Uh, and, and this legend of Garuda and Samati, so it sounds a bit like Icarus, I Icarus and Daedalus uh, from Greek myth. But actually, um, and this is just an interesting aside because it shows how myths often, you know, take different forms. Um, it's actually from the, from the Indian epic, the Ram Ramayana. Um, and uh, in, in that epic, a story happens where there are two, there are two you know, brothers and one is flying too close to the sun, so the, the other brother protects him with his wings, and then you know his wings are burnt and he loses them. Uh, so it's kind of similar to Icarus, but not exactly. Um, and that's just a fascinating, you know, way of how myths have a common origin but just change shape in different societies. Wow, I I had no idea. This, this is fascinating. Yeah, and this happened 27 years ago here in the prologue of 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 the Horizon. I want to bring up um, another quick quote here. That uh, that is interesting. It's it's fr it's from the wall, and again, this is this is a, a trial um, here in the context of this of this failed revolution and the wall again in present time. Uh, one of the elders, Amrit, is is um, talking here in front of the elders about um, about banning these new revolutionaries that. Uh, formed themselves, they call themselves the Young Tarafians, um, uh, honoring Taraf, who was hundreds of years ago was 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 mounting this revolution. I know it gets it sounds very complicated as I'm listening to my own voice. Go, do people even know what's going on? But I think people. Um, th this is actually another another uh, another reason why I really like your book. It is incredibly clearly. It's the structure is so clear, and the names are so good. This is something where, and I don't know. I mean, I'm not. I don't write novels. I don't write short stories. I write a lot of other things. But what I find fascinating is that some books with a with an uh, with a great plot, there, the confusion can arise with with names. So actually, let let me ask you this: How do you arrive at names? How do you settle on a name of a group, an individual, 
um, a context if you do world building because and I don't know I can't really analyze it why that is but I found found your book although there's a lot of names there's a lot of uh, different factions uh, I, I found it incredibly clear so oh, I'm glad you say so because a number of names begin with M and some people have become confused because there are too many names beginning with the letter M it wasn't, That's true. It wasn't <laughs> intentional but um, uh, yeah, but for the most part, the, the, the Indian names. Um, so Mithila actually means means earth. So you know, for obvious reasons, the main character is called Mithila because you know it, 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 it's connected to like earth um, in um, in 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 like it, it, you know in, again in the Ramayana and the Indian myth. Uh, and a, a, apart from that, like is I mean, it's it's mostly uh, Amrit. By, Amrit means nectar, by the way, um, because you know, he's, a, he's a great speaker and uh, speaks like. Speaks, ah. uh, like a great orator, right? So like nectar, um, speeches like nectar, um, and, and otherwise it's kind of been uh, the various small small references. Uh, so for example, there is a one of the elders, one of the counselors, uh, is um, is called Sanchika. You know, he's kind of a fiery counselor who wants to engage in land reform and you know kind of uh, bring bring power to to the to, you know the, the ordinary people. Uh, and Sanchika was effective. Was actually the the pen name of of a man called E M S Nambudripad, who was India's first elected communist uh, chief minister of a state. So there are these little little you know like little clues hidden away uh, that I really enjoy putting in. Uh, so a, a lot of the naming follows that kind of internal you know internal logic. Um, that's interesting uh, because then that's really yeah. kind of a side effect, at least in my perception. I don't know if that if that's feedback you gotten from uh, from other people, uh, but. Um, I want to read real quick, uh, and people, please keep comments coming also in in the local chat. So I'm looking at that as well, and we can uh, we can do another uh, five six minutes or so, and then we'll go into the post game and we open it up for questions. Uh, this is uh, Amrit you're mentioning, Amrit the Great Orator. This quote here is from the trial uh, where Amrit speaks. One question that must decide your vote and the vote is about banning this uh revolutionary group you must weigh the breaking of a barrier that binds us is there any and and breaking the barrier is breaching the wall or you know keeping going in in in, in trying to uh trying to uh get beyond this wall is there any need apart from a vague psychological satisfaction to bre breach the wall because none of us know what lies beyond the wall. Admittedly, I cannot show you definite loss for precisely the same reason. We simply don't know. I mean, I like that. I mean, it's just along what we're talking about from the very beginning here is uh, the fear of the unknown. And uh, but it's so it's just funny how he phrases this. Is there any need apart from a vague psychological satisfaction to to breach the wall? And I know this may be a little bit out of context, but I think we do have a slide. Um, we do have a slide from uh, Vladimir Lenin from what is to be done. <laughs> and that, that was not lost on me too, as uh, you know, as an emer uh, aspiring Marxist, um, because there is a book that is, or a, 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 a pamphlet that is referenced in your book is also called What is to be Done. Hey, what, and, what is to be done now? So it's, it's a bit of a Ah, that's right, right, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> what is to be done now? Uh, <laughs> So what is to be done was written by Lenin, I, I, I believe, in 1901 or 1902. And it's this little pamphlet uh, where he just um, lists what what he feels needs to be done in terms of revolution, in terms of, of mobilizing the masses. And this is a little quote here. Class political consciousness can be brought to the workers only from without. That is only from outside the economic struggle. The sphere from which alone it is possible to obtain this knowledge is the sphere of relationships of all classes to the state, the sphere of the interrelations between all classes. So he talks about class solidarity here. That is the only way to actually get people to, um, yeah, to start a revolution or, or at least start questioning the status quo once they see this class solidarity. Now this, the, uh, the Sum Sumerians, uh, they have something. Um, let me see if this is the right slide. They have the night of release, Gautam, to uh, to prevent that from happening. <laughs> I don't know yeah. if that's really re related. I mean, we have that too in Munich. We have the Oktoberfest. That's two weeks um, of getting hammered and forgetting that uh, 
I mean, at least there's class solidarity in getting in getting <laughs> hammered, I guess. Yeah. But uh, here it is. I fear the mob, Marvana, in this conversation here between Hansa, one of the elders, and Marvana, the leader of the scientists. I fear the mob. It sleeps for ages, and then it becomes the most fear fearsome thing. Uh, it's the carnival. If any of these people is planning something, that's the night will be totally defenseless. So this night of release, which is instituted to, so people get it out of their system, you know, their discontent, whatever, uh, is also the time when people get kind of riled up, I guess. So it's a double-edged sword for the So that's the actually like, there's actually like, uh, that comes from so James, James Scott, the, the anarchist uh, social, uh, social scientist. Uh, he talks about, in, in his book, um, how many societies have this kind of one day of, of the world turned upside down where all the class hierarchies you know uh invert themselves um and you know it's basically like you know the anything goes and and that serves as like a safety wall so like for one for one day which is the day of the carnival everything is inverted um and 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 that kind of allows for a certain kind of catharsis certain kind of release yeah uh, which then of course helps in like upholding the the um the overall class structure. On all the the, the kids, the kids tell me, the kids tell me that there is also a, a series of movies called The Purge, I guess. Oh, okay, okay, I, I haven't. <laughs> no, no, this is this is a, a long-standing thing because people know that I don't watch movies and I have a disdain for uh, audiovisual entertainment and I need to uh, Gautam. I mean, I, I need to have brand consistency if anything. But please go on. <laughs> yeah, no. So it was, it was it was modeled. The carnival is modeled on that and and. And I and I can tell you it will play a big role in 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 the, in the sequel. So it's, it's going to happen. <laughs> ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so this is not a trilogy. People love trilogies, uh, but you uh, you're against trilogies. It's a duology. Uh yeah. I'm, I I don't have a principal objection to trilogies, but this turned out a duology. You know, it it it, it was planned as two books. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I don't I don't know why trilogies are so prevalent in speculative fiction i actually don't know if that's statistically even true I, it feels true it, it feels true yeah <laughs> <laughs> we're dealing so we're oh god we live in a post reality uh real world where <laughs> where uh it just needs to feel true the truthiness of stephen colbert has become real um okay so we gotta wrap it up uh and we're gonna uh we can read this in the in the post game uh i want to bring up a slide that um shyla because she uh she researched uh this uh, you're uh, practicing a uh lawyer actually i don't know if you're practicing or if you're a research attorney my wife is a research attorney and people always ask her so what was your last case and she says well i worked behind the scenes in a more academic sense but i just wanted to mention to our audience that you have a really impressive resume um in that field as well as as a writer, there's a couple of books. They're here on the table in Second Life. And also this slide that I just brought up. Uh, these are some of your your issues um, that that I guess you, you research and, and work on and, and write about. Uh, prohibiting bail at first sight against the accused. A creation of a national register of citizens. Those are laws the Indian Supreme Court should strike down. Okay. Internet oh, yeah, shutdowns. In, in, in my view, but I'm among the minority who, who, who wants the Supreme Court to strike them down. <laughs> so. The Supreme Court, and this is, all, uh, and I know we got to wrap this up, but uh, is the Supreme Court uh, a worse institution in, in your country or in the United States? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Three hours later. I, I, I am going to, 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 uh, to, to plead silence on that. <laughs> ah, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, it, it. It is an un. I mean, this is also my view uh, in the U.S. context, where I'm most knowl more, more knowledgeable about. Uh, as a former radio um, news director, uh, the Supreme Court is uh, a big problem. It's 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 unaccountable. So. Um, but that's maybe we'll 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 have you back and talk about that with with someone who understands more than I do. Um, yeah, constitutional law says Stella here. Um, Gautam, uh, absolute pleasure. It's an absolute must read. Uh, please, folks, pick this up. You will not be disappointed. Thank you so much for coming, Gautam, and maybe Thank you'll come you so back. Much. The step was wonderful, and the amount of research you have put into the, the book has been amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm really, it's really been an honor. We're, we're reading it very close. I mean, I'm reading it closely. It's really great. And, and I don't know if, uh, I don't think Ruby was able, to, because of time constraints, read the whole book, but she translated from 
conversations with me this whole set uh these set ideas and so please folks if you have linden dollars um just put them in the tip jar right here on the side ruby did an extraordinary job last question to you gautam what are you reading right uh, now for pleasure i mean i'm not not talking about the uh trial transcripts <laughs> <laughs> i um i am reading um the sequel i'm reading an advanced review copy of the sequel to uh essa hansen's norfolk loss um it's called oh. Azur azura ghost uh, norfolk loss came out uh, last year and i think it was it was an utterly unique and uh, and quite uh, brilliant uh, debut and azura ghost is coming out i think soon sometime in the next few months uh so i'm just reading an advanced review copy of that and it's even better like it it just goes between multiverses uh spirit machines uh you know different species like it, it it's really good and i i would i would strongly recommend norfolk loss uh, and then asura ghost when it comes out so that that's what i've been reading and uh, reading that's what i'm reading right now please put that uh gotham if you can type that into the local chat here and then we'll we'll find uh the name of the author maybe the name of the book and we'll we'll, fi we'll find a link and for everybody else shala just posted the the book trailer on my youtube channel uh please go there and we'll do the, we do this every week and that's a good way to to um have one place where people can start a conversation about what they're reading post it as a comment on the youtube book trailer link that shyla posted what are you reading right now and what are you recommending and here is gautam uh, essa hansen nofek gloss it's the sequel to azura ghost no, okay no, no, nofek gloss is book 1 and azura ghost is oh. the sequel yeah nofek oh azura ghost is the sequel yeah, yeah. God, I don't. Uh, I'm I'm falling behind with my Marxist reading, Gautam, from my <laughs> from my young Marxist group uh, here in the undisclosed location where I live. So uh, I'll put that on the on the to read list. Um, let's run through the credit slides here real quick. The book club is every Wednesday, 12 o'clock uh, Pacific time. SL Book Club at Dragster.com is the email if you have recommendations or uh, critique. Um, sometimes the the show is at 5 p.m. Uh, when we have um, authors from other time zones. The show is produced by Isabel Sharen, Shaila the Super Gecko, myself, location manager Ruby, master builder Ruby, avatars made by Ruby, research by Shaila. Special thanks Marianne McCann, Arden Schwartzman, Theonine, AJ McDowell, and from Linden Lab, Brad and Patch, and all the moles at Linden Lab. And we have a whole bunch of sponsors that give us uh, merchandise, Bad Unicorn, Bespoke, Blueberry, Headhunters Island, Creatures, oh my God, Landscapes Unlimited, Crescendo, Linden Lab, of course, Nomad Rag, Salt and Pepper, Slink, Skin Stealer, Skin Stealer, The Black Forest, and What Next? We're on Island 3, and we're going to do a showcase of these builders. This is actually funny, Gautam, because in Second Life, these people are called builders. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, sometimes I do when I do interviews with Second Lifers, they say, "Well, I'm not a builder," you know. When they say, "Well, I just, you know, I just buy stuff and I arrange stuff," and and then I say, "Well, but you're still a creative." Ruby says, "Praise the builders." Ruby is an actual builder. Uh, she's like Alora. She was uh, she was against the other builders, but <laughs> I, uh, I digress. Um, if you again have critique or uh, input or uh, recommendations, SL Book Club at Drexter.com, or you can also message Jared the Bot. That's uh, Jared Bot avatar name. And uh, next week we have um, two shows. We have Maxine Kaplan, uh, who is an amazing young adult author with her new book Wench. Uh, Maxine Kaplan is. Uh, her mother is is well known, uh, at least to me and people uh, who love public radio. And I'm trying to lure her mother also into Second Life because she was in Second Life 12 years ago. <laughs> but uh, Maxine is an amazing author. There is uh, two books, Accidental Bad Girl and Wench. And then we have another show on on Thursday, the day right after, with, with uh, Ivy Pochoda and Meg Mundell talking about giving voice to homeless uh, people. They both wrote uh, books about uh, homeless people and actually had have essays, a uh, collection of essays written by homeless people. And that is all coming up next Wednesday right here on the Second Life Book Club and on the out. Please, camera, zoom up, go up like a Garuda, fly over the wall, and we're going to be quiet and we're going to watch the camera going out 
And that's it for the show. Goodbye, everybody.